I'm still here in New Orleans at this absolutely amazing uh, National World War II Museum, and I am here with my great pal. Um, prof- are you still professor? Uh, I don't call myself professor here. I'm the but you senior- are professor. I am the senior historian here at the National World War II Museum. However, but your name is Rob Satino. Yes, and, it is. And Rob is, uh, I'm sure you were voted or um, announced as being the greatest living professor of history in America at one point. In 2007, RateMyProfessors.com, the online rating service for students, (laughs) called me the number one professor in the United States, which was funny. I mean, you know, you don't run for it. It's a self-selected sample. Sure. It'd be churlish to turn it down. I I was very happy with it. take that on you. But I I even got um, the the publicity even reached into the United Kingdom, where if I knew the name of the author, I'll get it to you later, James, uh, said I was the fairy on top of the academic tree. Well, which is really kind of the most the beautiful thing I've ever seen. Yeah, that is that's, that's that's absolutely beautiful. That really is <laughs> lovely. Um, and I've got to say, um, people, that Rob is not only has he become a really good friend, um, we always have a blast whenever we hook up. Um, Indeed, he's also a man who's really, really influenced my writing and my work, and particularly uh, the stuff I was doing on the war in the West when I was first starting on that. You know, I read all your books and and um, the German way of war, and and. You really have, uh, you're one of a handful of historians who's really, really properly made me think, yeah, okay, I absolutely buy into that. Uh, there's not many. It's good, good. You okay. know, Adam I, Tooze I, is another, I would say. I would say Adam, Adam Tooze is very, I think, has a, Adam has a very strong point of view, which, he, which he, he fights his own corner well, man. He's got tons of evidence to back up everything he says. I really think, you know, I don't want to pick up a three or four hundred page book anymore at this stage of my life. I'm in my 60s now. Um, <laughs> unless it has You've something to You've got guitars to, say. to play. I have guitars to play. And I have mountains to climb. All those sort of things. But unless the book has a point of view, what, what we normally say in the academic business, the book has a thesis. I'm really right. not very interested in reading it at this point. So, as you know, my notion about the Germans is that they've, they evolved this sort of hard-hitting front-loaded, highly mobile, a form of war to win decisive battles at the outset, within weeks of the outset of fighting. This is Bewegungskrieg. And this is Bewegungskrieg, which, you know, the war of movement uh, auf Deutsch, war of movement in German. Um, Because they just didn't think they could win a longer war of attrition based on production and logistics. So this led them into, because they thought that, it led them into, you know, we would say all sorts of unusual maneuvers in both World War I and World War II, not really paying much attention to intelligence or counterintelligence or logistics. Or Who needs that? Because we're going to win. Because it's, we're because going to knock them out really quickly. prepared so carefully in peacetime that this is going to be over very quickly. And, you that's know, so both, interesting. So you really think that that's why intelligence, uh, German intelligence is so shit? I do. I just don't. I think if you had any... Look, in the American system, if you have something on the ball, they'll, they'll put you into the intelligence branch. You'll become a logistician. In Germany, the only thing really worth going for in, in, in the German military mm-hmm. mindset was into the maneuver arms, and so that's where all the most brilliant officers uh, officers went. Right. Uh, so there's a very there's a very small general staff, yeah, uh, and, and then there's these highly aggressive maneuver officers. Uh, the the operations section of the German general staff in World War II. So obviously, the one that would put together all the operations operations mm-hmm. section. If I'm, I'm, I think I'm getting this right. It had precisely 18 officers in it. And compared to the, you know, the American War Department, compared right. to the Pentagon, think about the Pentagon. There's, uh, there's 18 aides. All the, all the, operation, all the um, sure. staff officers have 18 aides. And those aides have 18 aides. And it's, there's hundreds. Of, you probably have to put the two zeros or three zeros after right. it to get the number of planners in a modern military. But the Germans, you know, very much based on that system of sort of the inspired genius, the Moltkean inspired genius. Clausewitz spent a lot of time talking about just what it meant to be a genius, military yep. a genius. But essentially what it meant was your ability to size up in a situation almost instantaneously. The, the, the French, the coup d'oeil, right? The, yep. the, 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 glan- the single glance of the eye. Yes. I mean, obviously it means terrain, but it means other things too. Yes. And, and that's really what and it also means six sense, which, uh, which you can only get, you know, from experience, right? Uh, yes, it's, it, it is. It is inborn it's in some way. Least, innate kind yeah. of. There's some innate quality re- reading the situation. There's some innate quality, and of course, it can be sharpened, uh, as all innate qualities can be then be sharpened by experience and training. Yeah. So um, I, I'm fascinated by that. Um, I, look, let's not let's not mock it too much. The Germans landed big blows at the beginning of both world wars. They were on the well, outs- they I, were on the I, outskirts I, of Paris in one, and they were on the outskirts of Moscow in the other. So, lest we turn World War II into some kind of 
gentlemen. So we're uh, with some kind of ev- uh, uh, foregone expression. conclusion. Let's right, yeah, treat yeah, World foregone. War II as a foregone conclusion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but but I, I think what really struck me when I was reading um, the German Way of War is this idea that basically this idea of, of, of Bavagan Street, this idea that you, you, you hit your enemy incredibly hard at the outright, knock them off their balance, then you do the kind of kettle schnack. Yes. That actually is as old as the hills comparatively for, for, for the Prussians. Yes. Russians, then the Germans. Yes. You know, they, they, Frederick the Elect has been doing it, Frederick yeah. the Great's been doing it, they do it in 1864, they do it in 1866, they do yes. it in 1914, yes. they, do it, they do it in 1940. I mean, nothing has changed. Basically, the principles haven't changed. What's changed is... The, 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 the kind of a kit they've got to do it. Yeah, so, um, so Bewegungskrieg, uh, the search for the Kesselschlag, the, the Battle of Encirclement, to put it you know, in its basic yeah. form. Um, under Maltke, it was done with widely separated armies, which, which attacked their adversary from, from multiple directions. And right. You're sort of forcing the adversary to kind of defend in too many places, and eventually right. they're going to find some place to, mm. you will find some place to flank and, and, and win. By World War II, it had turned into something approaching absolute physical encirclement. Right. Um, th- that is multiple mechanized columns moving like lightning, ranging all around your perimeter and fi- inevitably finding a weak spot and then just chopping you up like a roast. Right. I mean, that's what happened to the the, the Red Army in the opening yeah, four yeah. or five months of the I mean, the, it's just one East. encirclement after another, isn't it? There was the bi- Of course, the Germans landed a big one on the Anglo-French forces in, in France in 1940. There might have been something like two million men inside that pocket. It wasn't complete, of course. It was the yep. sea was on one side, and the British got to Dunkirk. Yeah, um, I know nowadays it's become de rigueur to talk about the, the encirclements on the eastern front that they were incomplete, and many Soviet troops managed to escape the encirclements. But yep, you know, but, look, but, you, you know, don't win a war by in- escaping encirclements. And no, uh, uh, that's true. And also, you know, I mean, this, I mean, the Allies get a lot of beef for kind of you know Germans getting away from Messina yes. or from the Falaise Gap or whatever. But but the, but the yeah, point, but if you were a German is, inside the Falaise Gap, you never wanted to relive that experience. That's all. <laughs> no, that, or inside the Falaise. No, no, that's certainly true. Uh, you know, but, every inch of it was my point raked is raked by Allied artillery fire. Every inch of the yeah, Falaise Gap. Totally. But you know, I mean. In, in Soviet Union, these encirclements. I mean, you know, it's not like putting a massive, huge, great wall around a, yeah, an army group. Point. I mean, there's lots of gaps. Of course, there's going to be, and particularly given the the road poor infrastructure of yep. the Western Soviet Union, there's a lot of ways to filter out and escape. But let us say the Germans surrounded um, 175,000 Soviets at Bialystok. Let us say then they su- they surrounded another 350,000 at Minsk, or so, and. And, and let us say that a handful, I don't know, let's say 10% of those troops escaped. That's still a big encirclement. So, where so were I was we? just I yeah. was just saying that even if 10% of the troops escaped those the encirclements, you really go, want go, a go. big victory. So, I mean, let's go to Kiev where, well, you know, there's a lot of, uh, what's the word, controversy about the Kiev encirclement. Is that a little mood music in the back, James? That's okay. That's fine. Well, we don't tinkling, mind a little, little bit of tinkling on the piano. Yeah, is that Patton's piano? I've been I'll, hearing about this. Patton's piano was in this Patton's hotel. Piano, and I promise. I mean, well, how amazing is that? I'll take you there in a moment if you haven't I seen it. I want to see it, yeah. Okay. Um, at, at, at Kiev, we hear a lot that the Germans were heading for Moscow. The road to Moscow was open. Hitler inexplicably turned into the Ukraine and yep. landed this big encirclement in Kiev. First of all, the, the road to Moscow wasn't open. We know that now. Yep. This tough Soviet uh, uh, defenses east of Smolensk. But, you know, you do turn into the Ukraine and you surround 700, you circle 750,000 Red Army troops. Let's say 10% of them once again escape. Let's say 20% of them escape. I don't care. That's not a heck of a lot that happens. It's still one of the greatest operational victories of all. Hard to call that one a blunder. I'm sorry, I've always felt that... Well, yes, yes, except that because they come with this ideological thing, anything less than total annihilation... Well, there you go. ...is yeah. not going to go. So 90%, it's a bit... <laughs> It's a bit like saying, you know, Monty saying that kind of Market Garden was ninety percent successful. You know, well, you the ten percent that wasn't successful is, yeah. is a problem. Uh, it's like saying an airplane that crashes on its way from Birmingham to London was successful if it got ninety percent of the way and crashed ten miles <laughs> outside of London. I mean, that's yeah. a ridiculous, that's a ridiculous thing to say. Um, of course it is. But but, but, but I will say, I will, you know, I'll, I'll coin a phrase that yeah. no one's ever said before. Go on, then. War is the continuation of politics by other means. So right. if your aims that's are total line. physical. I love that. If your aims are total physical annihilation on a racial basis of your adversary, you can expect war to the knife from the beginning. And of course, it's it's not it's not only a repulsive strategic aim; it's a ridiculous strategic aim. Yeah. No one's going to allow you to do that. Well, because, you because you're, you're you're making your job a victory just just a whole lot harder. Oh yes, yes, you've just you completely raised the stakes where victory could have been had. Um, a, a force on force, regular state on regular state. Who knows? Stalin. 
gets assassinated by one of his minions. Yep. Some Quisling government or some some uh, accommodationist yep. regime comes to the fore. It's entirely possible, but it was going to be tough to sell that one when the Germans came in murdering, and then kept murdering. Yeah, because I mean, talk murdering. about shoot yourself in the foot. I mean, yeah. you know, the, the, their operations in Bada Russia, the Baltic, Ukraine, where they could have expected quite a lot of sympathy for their arrival. You know, Certainly, not, they not, got a lot of sympathy in, in original entry into the Ukraine and into the Baltic states. So yeah, you know, but 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 they blow it by, you know, this sort of unbelievable kind of whirlwind of violence. Yes, I um, I've I've had to give a lot of thought because you know I'm interested in operations and I've had to give a lot of thought to what's underlying German military operations and you can't should never get too enthusiastic about any of them. No, um, it's not. It was not good. The, the 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 totality of the German victory in France was not good for the world. No, the, if they if the Germans had been held up there, maybe Hitler would have been overthrown in 1940 or 41. Uh, I, I think a very very high chance of that. I do too. Uh, and, so, and, and a lot of the senior Wehrmacht commanders thought that that was going to happen. Um, that's, well, not that he was going to be overthrown. That they weren't going to win. Certainly, uh, the vast majority did not go into the campaign in the West thinking they were about to win the kind of victory they did. No. And of course, the tragedy there is that's that's when Hitler really. Just really cemented his hold over everyone, over the entire nation. You could you can posit a certain kind of war weariness, sort of first of all, a kind of Nazi weariness in Germany in thirty eight and thirty nine. Yeah, yeah. You no can, one wants you war can, in nineteen thirty nine. You can posit it, and and then in in nineteen thirty nine, and then the nineteen thirty nine nineteen forty, um, you can posit a lot of nervousness on the part of the German population. Of course, nineteen forty just blew all that away. Hitler now seemed like an absolute stone military genius. His, yeah, yeah. his trained professional officers around him seemed like seemed uh, dull and orthodox and completely ordinary compared to this sort of specially endowed gift that Hitler had. And of course, that was nonsense. Um, Hitler starts out with some inspired choices, like a lot of beginners do. Yeah, but then he lapses into what we can only call, you know, unprofessional and, and even defective decisions very very early on um we had a good comment today and i'm, I'm not sure who made it was it david stahl from university of new south wales or was it rob nelson from university of windsor he said um gotta remember we're gonna say hitler invading the soviet union what a blunder no one can conquer russia but the germans had conquered it the last time out that is in world war one <laughs> right. it took him it took us longer than they thought it certainly wasn't any kind of lightning victory but there is nothing special about Russia. Regimes have been toppled from both directions in yeah. Russia. So, I, I, you know, Hitler invading Russia certainly turned out to be the biggest strategic blunder of all time. Certainly didn't look that way for the first two and a half months or so. Well, there's an awful lot of people who sort of... I mean, I mean the bottom line is, 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 you know, before he invades the Soviet Union, Operation Barbarossa, I mean, he's got two choices. He's either got to go for it or he's got to sue for peace somewhere. Yeah. And, and you know, clearly the super peace option's not on the table at all yeah, if you're yeah, Hitler. Yeah. So you have no choice because you're yeah. running out of stuff. You just aren't, you're not getting what you need. From so you get to the English the, Channel and you get to the English Channel in June of 1940, and it's way faster than you thought you would. Yeah. And now what? <laughs> and so the Germans, as you know, and spend 1940 um, going through all well, these running all these staff studies and they're invading, I, I, invading the Middle East, invading Persia, inv do, yeah, yeah. doing doing this or that, invading. Portugal invading the Azores. There's, yeah, yeah. there's a million operational plans on the table. Yeah, None of them are going to get you any closer to victory. But what does that show me, James? It shows me the Germans were convinced that you, you design a clever enough operation, you'll eventually win a war. But that's not necessarily true. No. You have to convince your opponent that it's hopeless. Yeah. And Churchill didn't never thought it was hopeless. No. With American backing, he certainly didn't think I it mean, was. lots of people did because I think they were so shell-shocked by what had happened because it just was so unscripted. Yeah. No one was expecting it to happen. So I think the shock of defeat is what... what what shatters so many people, you know, what, what is the genius of Churchill in the summer of 1940 is, is that he, bit by bit, manages to kind of persuade yeah. not just his immediate colleagues, which is the biggest obstacle, but yeah, then yeah. the whole country. But actually, there's lots, there's lots that Britain can actually feel quite confident about. There's any number of uh, our alternate histories which have Lord Halifax coming into, you know, into the prime ministership and, in May of 1940, and you know, reaching some kind of accommodation with yes. Hitler, and that's it's entirely possible. I think uh, it's funny. Well, look, Churchill came to power and immediately galvanized the entire nation. I, I, I agree with you. I don't think it was immediate at all, but I do think bit no, by bit. It's gradual. It's over the bit. And, yeah. and it's just to realize that the Germans aren't coming, that actually, you know, they've got a lot in their favor. They've got the dominions. They've got yeah. the, the empire. They've got this huge global reach. Um, there's all sorts of things that kind of, you know, that Britain has access to that the Germans don't. And, yeah. you know, that's all a big tick. And, oh, yeah. But, of course, as, as, as time passes, with every sort of passing day, every passing week, a month that the Germans don't arrive, However critical the situation may be, however kind of sort of, you know, strong the Germans might seem, um, 
they're getting used. The British people are getting used to that idea of what has happened. They've, 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 they're yeah, getting point. over the shock of, yeah, of the point. loss of France. You can, I mean, Dunkirk was a shock to the system. Fall of France. There's France, the rock of nineteen, you know, nineteen fourteen, and now mm-hmm. just just being submerged immediately. Um, yeah, that period is really interesting to me. There's this cabinet meeting that Churchill holds. <laughs> He says, I, I, I fully expect that within several weeks, most of us around this table will be lined up against a wall and shot. <laughs> yeah, hey, come on, man. That's great. Isn't How it? do you do that? Yeah, that's this is good, why we, it? you know, I don't know. I don't know what's going on in the UK and your feelings about Winston Churchill anymore. Oh, he's much him. beloved over here in the United no, States. No, I think he's I great. I think he's, I think he's a great <laughs> man, but I also think Roosevelt's a great man as well. I mean, that doesn't mean to say they don't make mistakes. It doesn't mean to say that yeah. some of their decisions are, are, are not great. But they're, they're really great men, and they, and they have this enormous geopolitical understanding, right. which is what you want, and you, you need global that. War. Yeah, yeah, global yeah, war. Well, they have global war. They, they, but they understand how they fit into the war. They understand what can be, what can be achieved. They understand strengths and weaknesses. Um, you know, Hitler is just so myopic. You know, yeah. Mussolini is even worse. The Japanese yeah. are even worse. You know, they just don't have that kind of big picture stuff that, that arguably Mussolini had decent strategic ideas that if Italy was to be a world player had to break out of its Mediter- Mediterranean prison and play out on the world's oceans so at least there's a strategy there I was reading um, uh, I just pop up uh, can I mention other people's books of course yeah. I just uh, uh, cracked open David Stahl's new book called The Retreat from Moscow that's the German retreat from Moscow yeah, in 1941 yeah. and 2 um, and uh, you know he's got Hitler in there screaming I don't know. It, it takes some random place to Sukhanichi must be held to the last man. And, and, I don't even know where it is on a map. No. I mean, I think Ber- I brilliant. think Berlin must be held to the last man, but every single village on the uh, you know, on, on on the soap from from horizon to horizon in the Soviet Union, that is not strategy to me. That's a it's sort of a tick. Yeah. Do you know what amazing, I mean? It's kind it? of a it's kind But of he always a, does this. And I mean, you know, I mean, he's he, he's so erratic and also he's so indecisive a lot of the time. Sometimes he's very indecisive, but a lot of the time he's very indecisive yeah. uh, and he's constantly hedging his bets which is just the worst possible thing because it means you're faffing it means you're prevaricating yeah. you're not being decisive but I remember think- I mean, as a, as a politician I would say this as, a, as an up and coming you know rising fascist and then as the as the Fuhrer of Germany not just the, par- not just the Nazi party Hitler had often done that he let the situation ripen until like there was only one option available mm. and then convinced himself that Providence had been leading him in that direction always Yep. And he did this. He always talked about providence. You know, I, I go, I, I walk with the assurance of a sleepwalker. You know, I'm just walking, and I know that I'm the providence is going to keep me safe. So it had worked for him in politics. Maybe it works in politics. It's probably the, I think, waiting until you only have one strategic option is not a strategy. <laughs> no, it's you not know? at all. I mean, one, if you only have one option, so look at the Japanese before Pearl Harbor. They had they, they were just debating whether to have played a, a ride on the northern road or the southern road. Yep. The northern road would be a, another go at the Soviet Union yep. after the big you know the disaster at Nomon Han, mm-hmm. um, and the southern road would be a strike into the Pacific to gain resource you know, resource rich yep. Southeast Asia. You'd have to knock out the United States fleet before you did that. And um, you know those are the two. And they tried one; it didn't work, and that was no one had. You know, they, they didn't want to do that again. They didn't want to fight Zhukov on the plains of Siberia. <laughs> right. They just don't have that kind of army. And so you know, they said, "Well, that's what we got left," and they, they bombed Pearl Harbor. But you know, there's a third strategy. Like that was the Northern Road, the Southern Road. How about the Road of Diplomacy? Yes, but, you know that that one probably. Yeah. Uh, how how about it. still buying stuff in from America? And, yeah, and, right, right. and kind of yeah. But I think I think look, and James, we're talking about fascist regimes here. Fascist regimes are predicated on the decisive man, the great genius, the personality. He sits alone in his room but sees all things. It's almost, you know, it's almost it's, it's idealist in a kind but, but of But also nationalism sense. as well. Oh yes, and that is, you know, you're based on based on the racial purity of the folk and all these crazy ideas Japanese have the Yamato race. Yep. But I always think fascist regimes are not prone to diplomacy. They're not prone to thoughtful no. debate of the issues. That's just that cuts against their grain. Of course so, because it's just, it, yeah, absolutely, because it's just not what they do. The whole point is, is they bend everybody else to their own way of thinking. Yes. So if in diplomacy, it's give and take. Yes. <laughs> you're not getting your way. And you're not getting your Both way. Both sides should walk away from the table in diplomacy. They should walk away dissatisfied, but saying, well, best we could do. Give fascism its due in the military sphere. It took two medium-sized powers, Germany and Japan, and made them real threats yes. to the Anglo-American sort of global dominion. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, two, the two powers, along with France at the beginning, who controlled the world's ocean and thus this controlled all trade. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it's bonkers, really, that they yeah. managed to get so far because you look at you look at 
you know what Germany hasn't got um, and it's it's the same shortcomings that it had that you you pointed out so brilliant in your work um, you know back in the 18th century and 17th century and yeah. 19th century you know they're, they're, they're largely landlocked they're not entirely but yeah. they're, they're stuck in the middle of Europe they don't have access to the world's oceans really right. Right. Um, you know the Baltic's a bit of a mess um, right. Right. you know there's a Royal Navy in the way if they want to get out of the North Sea right. um, they're, they're not resource rich anyway in that central part of Europe so where, you've got to get stuff from elsewhere yes, I just, or you've got to conquer it I, I just look back I look at the world of the 30s and 40s and there was real fear that Germany and Japan would come to dominate the globe. You know, we laugh at this notion today, yeah. and it is laughable. I think today, Ger- I think Germany is today what it was always destined to be, a strong regional power, which yeah. frightens its immediate neighbors and has enormous uh, 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 financial strength, you know, yeah. uh, economic strength. And not everyone's happy about Germany today, but um, the fascist dream. It, I mean, it, it's. Uh, I, I said, you know, give, give it its due. I don't. I, that's the wrong way to put it. It was a seductive vision, both internally, but also externally, that these powers were irresistible, and that was kind of a. That was a that's a coin of the realm too, mm. it, like ancient Sparta. You know, only had like five thousand warriors, and, and they rarely fought a big war because they had a reputation that they were so perfect as warriors that they would just mop up the floor with anybody. So people tread very lightly around them, and that's that's appeasement. Yep. It, was, it was reputation that Hitler was saying yeah, we're yeah. really powerful, and it's a projection of power, isn't it? The projection of power. That's a and again, that's why they don't have you know horses in the newsreels. You just have kind of half tracks and panzers. Of course. Um, so, um, in I mean, I love, I love it. No, the story. What's that amazing story of the of the um, of the French chief of the air force who comes up in 1938 right. and he goes and visits Erhard Milk and the Luftwaffe? Yes, and they and, keep, and they keep taking off and running that and go flying to the so next. So they're taking him to an airfield, and he comes back and goes, "We haven't got a chance. We're never filled with Messerschmitts. They take him to another airfield, yeah. filled with Messerschmitts. Same Messerschmitts. It's the same Messerschmitts, <laughs> different airfield. Yeah, I've heard that story many times. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, I have no doubt that it's true. Um, I, well, I forget which one of my books. Maybe Death of the Wehrmacht. Or one of the of my Wehrmacht trilogy so-called uh, Gerhard Weinberg when I was showing him the manuscript he reads my manuscripts a wonderful yep. senior you got the you got the dominant figure in the field for the last 50 years reading your stuff you always feel pretty protected yep. but also a bit nervous he said I, I like the book um, love the book but I, I was you know look at your photos it's all tanks 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 he said if you really want an honest picture of the Wehrmacht it should be horses and men horses and men horses and men yeah, yeah. I said well you know nobody will buy the book but, <laughs> but, but it, it absolutely is um you know the number at the outset. There were a handful of Panzer divisions and a handful of so-called light divisions. Yeah. Halfway houses between a cavalry division and a Panzer mm-hmm. division. And that was about it. The rest of that army, uh, you know, walked to war just like his fathers had done. Yeah, yeah. Uh, although, the rest of the Wehrmacht was far less well trained than the Imperial yeah, Army in 1914. Yeah, yeah. Far less well yeah, trained. Yeah. But even even in 1940, I think only 35 percent of the army was probably trained, fully trained. The, the attacks and yeah, that, that'd be about right. There were cla- there was uh, 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 the, you know sort of class A's and B's and right. C's and and, right. you and reservists and all the rest of it. And there's just really a, a relatively small handful of divisions, including the mechanized divisions, working in concert with the um, working in concert with the Luftwaffe. So I mean, there's the there's the myth of Blitzkrieg that this was just an all-conquering army that would crush anything in this path. And if you look at a Panzer One today, you know, it's kind of funny. Yeah, yeah, six it's, foot it, and it's got a little sort of PG. It's a tankette. It's a tankette. Right, it has a two-man crew <laughs> and it doesn't have a main gun. No. It's a two-man crew and has a machine it's gun, a, a turret. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's it's probably imper- it's barely impervious to small arms fire. Yeah. Um, but it's certainly not impervious to a hit from anything you know anything larger than that. Uh, it's amazing how people just still go on and on about how hey, brilliant, I, brilliant German kit, kit is. I, now I I did an interesting. We do travel programs here at the museum. Right. Which we take guests to various travel sites, World War II related. Right. We have I'm a historian. I lecture usually on ship. We have. Ace, you know, yep. tour guys on the site. Right. So we recently went to Crete. Oh yes, you've had your just had your Aegean foray. I just had my you? Aegean foray. Yes, I, I have gazed upon the bust of Agamemnon and all kinds of other things right. too. We just had a, a great time. Um, we saw the, the the burial mound of the warriors at Marathon. Right. You know, the 192 who gave their lives. Of Fantastic. Western civilization in yeah, 490 yeah. BC, BCE. Um, but then we went to Crete and uh, we saw ancient sites, the Palace of Knossos, you know, yeah, yeah. Minos's palace. Yeah, that's good, isn't it? Oh. But then we went to Malame, where the big parrot mm. drop was, where the German paratroopers were. The you know, airfield so the, 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 has never been lost. The myth is, you know, they just came down, they seized yeah. that island. But you read that campaign. They came out of those airplanes, and they got shot to pieces by Absolutely. fully yeah. alert, alerted they, lo- they lost 50% casualties. So you go to the, the over, overlooking the big airfield where, where the fight was, the German air paratroopers had to seize it so they could yep. reinforce it. Um, overlooking that is a German military cemetery, mm-hmm. meticulously kept. Yep. Yeah, uh, the, the Germans bury en masse, you know, so it's not one man, one Yeah, no, no, exactly, yeah. And it's just, you know... It's quite something, isn't it? It's the same day. 
Yep. May 1941, May 1941, May 1941, May 1941, May 1941, they were all killed the same day. Yep. You can't believe it. Yep. I mean, you, you walk down yep. the road and you say, well, who was left? Well, you know, just enough was left to yep. seize that airfield from a kind of, you know, confused defense. Yeah, no, New Zealanders get, get blamed. Everyone was out of communications. No one yep. knew where anybody was. But It shouldn't have, it shouldn't, it shouldn't have happened. But, but, that, but to me is the, that to me is, is the myth of Blitzkrieg. It's all... It's all the series is it's all, all powerful yeah, airdrop. But, but, okay, so, so, so t- t- 10th of May 1940. Yeah. You know, it's always one-way traffic, right, for the Germans. You know, they come down, they capture Evan and Mail, they kind of capture all the bridges, yeah. the, you know, whatever they need yeah. to capture. Um, 353 aircraft lost in one day. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, that is the single worst day for yeah. the Luftwaffe in the entire yeah, world. Yeah, no, no, there's... um. <laughs> here's something else, too. We're in Greece, you know. Crete is a Greek island, yeah. and... You talk about the Germans fighting the British and the Commonwealth, and the Greeks say, "What about us?" They played a made. There were a lot of Greek troops on that island too. Yeah, and they, yeah. were, they had their they had their anti-aircraft guns and their 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 weapons trained yes, a lot. Yes, they did. Just and there were Cretan fighters and Greeks. Um, I spoke here in, in uh, New Orleans a couple weeks ago on Ohi Day. So Ohi is the Greek word for no. Ohi Day is a day celebrated by the Greeks, the day that Mussolini put his demands in front of Metaxas, and Metaxas said Oh. So he said no. And so the Italians invaded. You know the sequence, James. Mm-hmm. They got held up. They got beaten back. Hitler had to ride to his rescue, blah, blah, blah. And, all, and as a result, Operation Barbarossa was weeks late, and thus yes. Greece saved Western civilization. As Again. it had this in 494 BC. <laughs> it, it, um, I have uh, my, my, my nephew's married to a, a very beautiful young Greek woman. They just had their first child. So we have a Greek member of the family now. Um, but it, it struck me that, so that's Greek, the, the narratives of World War II that we all have, and that's Greece's narrative. And uh, who can say Well, Greece's wrong? story is rather yeah, under, rather under sell, but it's a fantastic yeah. story. It's yeah. amazing. So I just, to me, um, this will always, this will always be about narratives, you know. I, I've mm. learned that more and more. I, 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 I write what I believe is factual history. You know, I would never knowingly put down a falsehood, and I'd probably no, have sure. unknowingly put down more than a few if you write as many words as I have, probably. Yeah, yeah, well, likewise. Um, but, uh, but really, I, yeah, sure, it's factual, but it's also about points of view, and we definitely have one here at the museum. We have one in the States. You know, we, we have we have the British narrative, you know, their mm-hmm. finest hour. Yep. Britain stands alone, and, uh, you know, with only 800 million people around the globe standing <laughs> behind you while you were standing alone, yeah, or the whatever, the, navy. whatever the number, yeah, yeah, largest yeah, navy yeah, in the yeah, world. Yeah, yeah. You've done, I think, marvelous work and kind of, you know, calling that whole notion into question. But it doesn't matter how what you do. It doesn't matter what I do. People are always going to think Britain oh, stood alone. I know. It's the narrative. Little Britain. Yeah. yeah. Okay, just listen, before before we, we split, because you've got to go and I've got to go. Um, I, I, I've re- the other thing I think is really interesting is, is your blaming of the Vermont generals. And I yeah. think that's fascinating. Yeah. They're um because they, they kind of they like to make out that you know we were only following the orders. Yeah, just remember out. they were only following orders. If Hitler had listened to us, we would have won the war. They all wrote memoirs after the war, um, obviously trying to exculpate themselves. Let's face it, that's why people write memoirs. I mean, I don't really blame them for it. Nobody's going to write a, 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 write a, a self-incriminating memoir. I mean, <laughs> the last one of those was like Saint Augustine. You know, right. you have to go way, way back. Um, but none of those things are true. They, they backed Hitler from the very beginning. They, many of them supported him coming to power. They backed his plans for rearmament. They were enthusiastic about the Polish campaign, a little nervous about the French. Then he carried all before him, whatever they said later. Totally on board for Barbarossa. Yep. They thought they were going to Moscow in a lunge. They did. I mean, even the staff studies, I mean, they had stu- They knew what the operational plan is. It might have to be a lull at Smolensk and, and so on, but... They thought they were going to win that campaign, and and uh, so and then on and on. Uh, every time we say Hitler made a mistake, what he was doing was adjudicating between an argument within his generalship and general staff about whether or not to do the Kursk campaign and exactly when to do the Kursk offensive, for example, or earlier, launching the campaign into southern reaches of the Eastern Front in 1942. So. At the end of the war, they were writing memoirs saying we didn't, we weren't on board. We didn't do any of those things. We hated him. We thought he was nasty. We didn't like the, we didn't like the way he ate his peas with a knife. You know, that, these ridiculous <laughs> things. Or the way he slurped his soup. Yeah. One of it, one there's a there's a G- German officer. Uh, it's Gersdorf's memoirs, I think, who says that I remember when I saw Hitler just slurping his vegetable soup. I mean, it was so I, disgusting. I mean, yeah, to me. no, I mean, clearly um, he's up to the. But look, look they were they were they were all up for war crimes, and they were up, almost all of them were up to their eyeballs in war crimes. They were looking for friends in the West. They, they, had, they, they wrote these fascinating memoirs. Guderian, Monstein, Melanton. I grew up on that stuff. Yeah. I cut my teeth as a young historian reading The Other Side of the Hill. Panzer Battles, The Other Side of the Hill, which is a little, a little heart. Book, yeah. 
German generals looking to solidify their reputations. Little Hart looking to solidify his reputation as the father of Blitzkrieg. Oh, yes, uh, yeah, a hey, hey, Little Hart. I mean, the influence you had on us yeah. in the 1930s was enormous. We had, we had no idea until we read your book, whichever yeah, yeah. book. You know. By the way, if you can put a good word in the war tr crimes tribunal, that would be great. <laughs> oh, yeah, you know, exactly. I mean, it would really that's help. What's yeah, going on, isn't we it? need friends. Oh, and, and the, the greatest memoir of them all, Lost Battles by Erich von Manstein. It's the greatest uh, German military memoir of all time. You know, not only were they convincing, and these were very attractive, noble, you know, figures from old noble families, and Americans always kind of love that sort of thing. Mm. Um, the Prussian you know, aristocracy. The, yes, you know, kind of like that, even though we live in a democracy. Maybe precisely because we live in a democracy. We like that sort of thing. But... Um, there was also a, a, there was a new there was a new enemy out there. It was the Russians. Yeah. Cold War, and suddenly, you know, who had experience fighting the Russians? Yeah, it was these guys. And the Germans were able to sell us a, 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 a real bill of goods in the course of the 50s, mm. 60s, 70s. And I would say the peak Wehrmacht worship in the United States, 1980s, yeah. in the uh, U.S. military yes. establishment. Uh, seminars at the U.S. Army War College, inviting Melanton, inviting Amazing. German officers. So yeah, it's great stuff. Um, but I still that's, that still stirs my soul. I no longer really believe it. But yeah. when I read it, I feel like a twelve year old again. Which you know, when you enter your sixties, you, <laughs> but they were you can't put a price on that. They, can't you know, put a price on that. But day. they were bastards, and they and they did really bad things. Yeah, I, I, almost top to bottom. You can find some exceptions. I mean, you you can. Um, the, the exceptions prove the rule, right? Right. The fact that you get this or that, and then there's five hundred officers who you know really did horrible things. I'm currently writing a book which will, is going to look at Ger Hitler's relations with late war officers. You know Guderian and Rommel and, and, yeah, and yeah, Melton. Yeah. You know all these guys. Uh, Modell maybe. Even. But you probably don't know Schoerner or yeah, Rendelich or some of, these, yeah, one of the worst. some of these characters at the end of the war. Um, he was horrible, wasn't uh, he? Just a, a butcher. I'm not only a butcher uh, in, that, in that he drove his men into ridiculous military operations which they had no hope of winning. But, you know, yeah. just executing them wholesale on yeah. specious mm -hmm. charges of cowardice. You know, and then my French isn't himself. good, but my French isn't good. But I'm gonna say it anyway. Pour encourager les autres. Is that right? <laughs> to, yeah, so. to encourage the others, I think yeah. so. That's good. No, I think it's pretty good. I thought that accent was faultless. <laughs> That's a New Orleans yeah, Italian Schoenis, Schoenis, American French. Yeah, is one French. of the most despicable people ever, isn't he? And he's Wehrmacht. You know, yeah, he's yeah. He's no, he's not. Uh, so if you just say, "Oh well, the Waffen SS did these things," but the Wehrmacht had clean hands, that will get you a. At your local historian, uh, a bar that will get you a laugh, you know, from yeah, the yeah, patrons yeah. around the around the bar. So, the the the, the entire history of the uh, of the Wehrmacht has been rewritten, in, in I would say the last twenty five years. But it should be the entire history of everything has been rewritten in the last twenty five yeah, yeah. years. And who knows what? Well, it new... doesn't stand still, does it? I run No, it can it, it can I hope it never does stand still. I try to find you know I'll try to find another line of work. <laughs> On that note. On that note. Brilliant. Rob, right. as always, it's lovely to see you, and, James, um, and thanks nice. for always, that. Always a treat. You, you have an a open invitation to New Orleans, and I hope I have an open invitation to Chalk Valley. Hey, you I always do. down on tape, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm into that.